And again, good morning, and thank you for uh, attending this morning. Uh, my name is Terry Allman, and uh, with me is Kim Renners. We are co-directors of wealth management for OJM Group. Um, today, we're going to talk about a couple of items. Here we go. Uh, starting off, we're, we're going to tell you a little bit about ourselves, uh, OJM Group as a firm, and um, uh, specifically what Kim and I do. Uh, then we're going to get into the meat of the discussion, why investors make poor investment decisions. And there's been a lot of research done around this over the last really 20 years, but it's really uh, been a very hot topic in investing circles for the last 10 years or so. Uh, we'll discuss common investor mistakes and, and how to avoid those, and, and then we'll wrap up with some questions. Um, but first off, because this is an uh, investment conversation, we need to uh, put a few disclaimers out there. Please uh, take a moment, and I'll scroll through these. Uh. OK. Um, OJM Group uh, is a comprehensive uh, financial consulting firm. And uh, by that, what we mean is we, we do uh, full consulting on asset protection, investment management, retirement planning, education, all the services you see here on the screen, especially tax advisory services uh, and insurance planning. Uh, up in the top left-hand corner, you see the Odell Group, fee-based plans and investments. And that's really the, the group that Kim and I uh, are charged with running. And uh, uh, we manage uh, currently about $220 million in assets and uh, have been growing very nicely over the last couple of years. Um, the partners of our firm, David Mandel and Jason Odell, have uh, partnered with several groups and written several publications. At the end of this uh, um, webinar, you'll have the opportunity to request uh, a free book. And uh, we recommend you do that if you don't already have uh, one of our publications. Uh, they provide very good information. Uh, a lot of it's tailored to physicians. That's a, a core market of ours, but we also uh, manage assets for non-physicians and business owners, etc. All right, common investor mistakes. First off, let's take a look here. Uh, this is a study that's uh, updated on an annual basis by a consulting firm called Dalbar. They're based out of Boston, Massachusetts. But um, what we're looking at here is the average return for the uh, average stock fund investor, uh, as well as for the bond investor. And, and as you notice, uh, both of them are quite a ways below the average returns for the benchmark S&P 500 and the Barclays Aggregate Bond Index. And uh, you know, our charge today, what we want to talk about is why would this be the case? Um, you know, are the professional investors that much uh, superior? Uh, in some ways, no, but uh, in some ways they, they have processes and, and put procedures in place that uh, allow them to minimize certain mistakes. First off, let's take a look at what is the most detrimental mistake that investors actually make. And if you um, take a look at the uh, uh, screen here, you can see that not paying enough attention to asset allocation is the largest with trying to time the market coming in a close second. Um, that accounts for about 64% of investor mistakes between those two items. Uh, also, having too much money in one investment, holding on to investments too long, uh, and then buying overvalued investments. And this is something that, uh, you know, in our line of business we see very frequently as uh, Kim and I bring new new clients on board one of the first things we, we look at is where they currently are invested and uh, you know as you might expect uh, we see way too much money uh, a lot of times in large US equities uh, or too much in a former company stock or something like that so uh, you know the next question is why do investors make some of these mistakes a lot of bad investment decisions result from loss aversion. And uh, loss aversion and several other um, more technical behavioral finance uh, terms 
came from uh, Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman's uh, Advances in Prospect Theory paper, which actually won the Nobel Prize for Economics. Um, but what they found, and what, what's it's not really earth-shattering when you think about it, and, and we'll take a look. This is kind of a mathematical representation. On, on the x-axis, we see uh, on the left-hand side are losses, and on the right-hand side are investment gains. On the y-axis, we see the pain experience from the losses versus the pleasure uh, experience from the pains. And if you notice right where the, everything crosses in the middle, you can see no big surprise here. Uh, people enjoy gains, and, and that curves upward. But if you notice on the left-hand side, the pains drop. The, the pain felt from investment losses drops off dramatically and rapidly. So what we're looking at here is individuals dislike losses twice as much as they enjoy gains. This causes people to make suboptimal decisions when it comes to investing. They're prone to make knee-jerk reactions and, and maybe sell when things are going down when that's actually the time to buy. Um, we'll take another look at how this sort of impacts and plays out. Uh, something as simple as the frequency with which we view return data can have a dramatic impact on how we invest. And this isn't necessarily a good thing, as you might imagine. If we take a, a simple look here at 2010's monthly returns of the S&P 500, you can see uh, at the end of the year, the, the returns for the full year were a 15% return. But if you break that down into the monthly segments, you can see there were some rough months there from May through August. And it's those types of bad monthly experiences that cause people to deviate from what might be a good long-term plan because uh, uh, they're worried about the losses mounting up. So they exit at exactly the wrong time. This slide does a great job of showing how loss aversion can distort the way we're investing. Um, they did a study, and they showed um, uh, monthly returns. If investors look at monthly returns, they're going to see a negative report roughly 40% of the time. If they only look at the annual return of investments, they're likely to see a negative report about 14% of the time. Uh, so then they ask those subjects to allocate among different asset classes. Well, the folks seeing the annual returns had a 70% allocation to equities, while the folks who were shown the monthly returns only allocated 41%. So you can see something as simple as the frequency with which we view return data can have a dramatic impact on how we actually allocate our assets. And as you can imagine, this creates scenarios where people are grossly underweight in certain asset classes that they should be exposed to. So how do we overcome this hardwired impulse to do the wrong thing at the wrong time? A couple items. Number one, Knowledge is important. We fear the pain of loss more than we feel attracted to possible gain. This causes us to make impulsive decisions. The first step is being aware and understanding that this is a natural emotion. Um, next, you know, we recommend hiring a professional to help take the emotion out of this equation. And Kim and I joke frequently, and it's really not even a joke, but part of what we do is, is as much uh, being a counselor as an investment professional. Frequently after uh, you know market volatility like we saw in 2011, we'll get calls from clients. And, and it's our job to help them make sure that they're looking at the longer term, that uh, understand that the plan that's in place and, and the investment process that we've put in place accounts for frequent ups and downs in the market. Uh, and that said, it's important to define your goals and objectives and a long-term strategy to reach them. Uh, having an investment policy in place is always a good thing as well. That helps you sort of bring yourself back to, uh, bring your bearings back when things aren't going well. So 
what are the ways we assist clients in avoiding these common mistakes? Number one is basically our investment strategy and philosophy. Um, step one, we're going to diversify across different asset classes. Uh, what this does is minimize some of the, the steep declines and, and uh, takes off some of the gains, but what we're trying to capture as much of the gain as possible while minimizing losses. And if we can smooth out the trajectory of returns over time, we find that helps investors stay invested and not make rash decisions. Uh, step two, select the different weights of those asset classes, and we'll talk about these in a little more detail here in a moment. Step three, select the individual securities that we're going to weight within the classes. Step four, rebalance, and then we also want to maximize after-tax returns. And After all, it's what you take home at the end of the day that's important not uh, necessarily what return you see on a piece of paper. Just a, a quick lesson in diversification. Uh, this is uh, benchmarked against the Russell 3000 index, which is a, a, a very large encapsulating index that captures a, a lot of the equity markets. And as you can see, uh, at the top, correlation is a correlation of one means two different investments move in the same direction at the same time 100% of the time. Um, so what we want to do is build a portfolio where the different assets in the portfolio don't all move together at the same time. A correlation of zero would mean that uh, there is no correlation between the different investments. And as you can see, it's most investments have some degree of correlation, and our job is is to blend the lower correlated items with uh, some of the items, uh, the investments that are a little more highly correlated. Also, not pictured here are some asset classes we utilize uh, that are more in the what we call alternative assets, things like hedge funds of funds, commodities, uh, non-traded real estate. Uh, managed futures. These also give us different risk return profiles that allow us to further diversify portfolios. And you can see here some of the benefits of low correlations. If you look at these different periods when the stock markets uh, pulled back quite a bit, 29% uh, between December of 68 and June of 70, uh, all the way up through November of 07 and February of 09, very negative returns in the market, but something as simple as a bond allocation, which we can look at on the right, bonds did quite well over those time frames. So blending these two different investments helps smooth out that up and down ride that uh, really is disconcerting for most investors. And as I mentioned, uh, as we looked at the prior screen, we utilize several other alternative asset classes as well to further smooth out this ride. You know, the step two in our process is to actually select the asset class weights. Uh, we may typically want to put 10 or 20 percent in U.S. large cap growth equities and maybe 20 percent in bonds, etc. We run a quantitative review of the different correlations among the asset classes. These correlations change over time, so it's important that, you know, on a quarterly basis or so, we, we analyze whether the, the correlations are increasing or decreasing among different asset classes. Uh, we also evaluate historical risk and return trade-offs among the asset classes. It's great to smooth out the ride, but we want to get positive returns. Uh, and that's something I, I want to stress. Sometimes uh, when we try to explain to people how uh, important it is to diversify risk, um, we get the question, well, what about returns? And please be aware, returns are foremost in our thought process, but reducing risk in a portfolio, reducing the, the amount of uh, losses at any given point in time, ultimately over longer periods of time, really provide much better weighted returns. Uh, we also want to select the efficient portfolio weights. How much of each asset class are we going to allocate funds to. Uh, 
the next piece is probably the most important in my mind, though. We want to evaluate. We're going to look at historical correlations, and we're going to look at historical returns to give ourselves a, a good benchmark. But we really want to evaluate what's going on looking forward. We're going to evaluate the global in economic environment and what's going on in the markets here over the very recent past and extrapolate forward. And we'll reweight some of these asset classes based on what we see coming up. Um, and just for instance, over the last uh, few months, we've been allocating a greater percentage to what we consider alternative fixed income, which is high yield bonds and emerging market debt. We feel there's a very good risk reward trade off there uh, given certain economic factors right now. Uh, also, on kind of a longer term basis, we've been proponents of the alternative asset classes I mentioned earlier. We think uh, uh, stocks and bonds, uh, uh, we're going to get some returns in those classes over the next few years, but they're probably not going to be the types of returns we saw back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, we're in a very sideways market right now, and we feel like some alternatives in the portfolio help boost return while reducing risk. The next thing, we're going to adjust the portfolio weights, as I mentioned, on a forward-looking basis. Step three, select individual securities. This is the part that I think uh, most individuals spend a lot, you know, the bulk of their time on, and it's certainly a very important part, but it, if you notice, it's step three for us. First, we want to get that asset classes defined, what makes sense to be in right now moving forward. Uh, number two, what are the weights of those classes? And then here we are at three, which specific securities fit that asset class? And, and first, it'll be the security type that we'll look at. Does a mutual fund make sense? Does an ETF or individual securities? And um, for each of these, we're going to evaluate the performance of the manager. Some asset classes lend themselves more to active management. Large cap value and growth equities we tend to use uh, ETFs there. We want to keep the, the cost low. We want the portfolio to be transparent. And active managers haven't shown a very good ability to consistently beat the benchmarks. However, if you look at bonds, if you own an index or an ETF of bonds, you're basically buying the most indebted companies' bonds or the most indebted government's bonds. So we prefer active managers there and often use mutual funds in those asset classes because we believe that certain managers have the ability to outperform the benchmarks, and they've shown that they can do that. Uh, we also are going to evaluate the fees of the underlying funds. Obviously, as I kind of mentioned earlier, why pay fees for active management if active management doesn't consistently provide the types of returns we're looking at? Once we find a, a fund or an ETF or two, we'll have multiple discussions with the, um, the sponsors, the managers of those funds, um, to make sure we understand the philosophy of the company, uh, the, the way they invest funds, what their, uh, what their, not just what their track record was, but how they arrived at that track record, and hopefully what they looked like over various market cycles. And, uh, to kind of bring that all back, we'll do fundamental evaluation of individual stocks and bonds. If we think a client's portfolio makes sense, we'll pick individual securities, and we have uh, the resources in-house to do that. The fourth step is rebalancing. One of the most simple things you can do and uh, one thing that um, uh, very few people uh, seem to do on a regular basis, and this kind of goes against, again, that way we're hardwired. Once something's been appreciating in value, it's very difficult for most individuals to say, hey, it's time to take some off the table. So what we do is on a quarterly, monthly, annual basis, we tend to rebalance on an annual basis. We feel rebalancing more frequently than that, and, and certain studies we've looked at show that not a lot of value gets added if you're 
rebalancing too frequently. Sometimes you want to let some of those things run a little bit. If stocks are moving good like they have in the last couple months, we're going to let that play out a little bit. But periodically, we're going to rebalance the portfolio, sell some of the things that have gained, and roll that back into maybe some asset classes that have underperformed. In 2011, uh, an asset class that we believe very strongly in, the emerging market equity space, had a horrendous year. Um, I think it was down about 18 percent. Well, as we started this year, you know, we're looking to top that back up and take off some of the asset classes that had performed well. And that has worked out quite well so far this year because uh, emerging markets have come strong out of the gate. But uh, what this does is it provides a systematic uh, mechanism to purchase lower priced items and sell things that have gotten a little bit pricey. So if you just do a simple rebalance on an annual basis, it's a very nice way to uh, keep your portfolio from becoming um, top heavy with items that are probably due for correction. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Kim Renners. She's going to go over uh, how to maximize after-tax returns and, and bring things home. Great. Thanks, Terry. And before I get into some of the tax items, uh, we're going to launch a poll, and we'd like everybody to participate. And um, it should show up on your screen here in a second. There we are. What is the best way to minimize buying high and selling low? And so if you could just select one of the answers below. Consult with your psychic Aunt Millie, uh, watching financial television, or periodic rebalancing. Terry just gave us a, a really good slide on um, what we think the answer might be. We just want to make sure everybody's still with us out there and, and listening. Uh, to this presentation. So we'll close the poll and I can see the answers and congratulations we have everybody with us. P -p Periodic rebalancing obviously um, is very important as Terry just mentioned. You know in, in any investment strategy you know another time just to add to a few of his points another really good time to actually do some rebalancing would be um, a big life event you know whether it be a large outflow or inflow of cash into your investment portfolio and then um, again you know after a particular market move that would be significantly high or low which would, would be a really good time to be rebalancing your portfolios you know either yourself or with the um, assistance of your investment advisor. Okay, great. Well, let's move on to some of the, uh, the tax consequences of um, managing money. And um, as we all know, if you have qualified accounts, retirement accounts, there's really no tax effect in any trading that you may be doing currently, right? So those accounts would be taxed once money starts coming out at retirement. And the money comes out at you know, if you have traditional IRAs or 401ks, money's coming out at your ordinary income rate, um, which currently is about the third lowest in the history of the tax code. Um, lots of discussions going on right now as to whether that's going to change. Uh, the administration is um, putting some things on the table now. And, and if nothing is done, basically, in 2013, we're going to, the Bush tax cuts are going to sunset and we're going to go back to higher rates automatically. So we have a feeling there's going to be a lot of discussions this year in regards to taxes. I don't know if anything will get done. That is to be determined. Um, but if you have accounts that are brokerage accounts that are not qualified money, then you're going to have to deal with taxes each year. So as, you know, as income comes in to your portfolio from whether it be an individual bond, a bond fund, a dividend on a stock, there's different tax consequences to each. And you know what we stress really is um, you need to be aware of this. Because, and you'll see this on the next slide once I go through this, taxes can have a negative effect on your portfolio performance. You know, it seems like a basic statement to make that we all should be aware of, but sometimes that's not even considered. Um, 
some of the advisors maybe that you talk to um, maybe don't have that background or experience or that knowledge and, and don't have an entire team working for you um, that understands that position. You know, when you invest in mutual funds, you invest in a particular manager and a particular strategy. They're not managing money for, you know, Dr. Sue. They're managing money to their strategy. And so Dr. Sue's in a particular situation where she's in the highest tax bracket. And, um, you know, I always like to give this example because it really shows, um, showed me a lot. In 2008, when the market, the stock market performed very poorly when we were, you know, going through um, the financial crisis, there were many mutual funds managers out there that were down 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, whatever the number was. And even at the end of the year, still paid out capital gains on the funds. And so not only was your holding down significantly that year, just like the rest of the market, but kind of adding insult to injury, you uh, had to pay tax on the distribution that you received that was capital gains. And, and you received that distribution because uh, managers pass that through to the shareholders. They do trading throughout the course of the year and take gains. They took some gains maybe on long-term positions and then paid that out to the shareholder. You had to pay 15% tax on it. So I know Terry already mentioned a little bit earlier, it, it's tough to, you know, once you get to a portfolio size that becomes significant, it's tough to only invest in mutual funds. You know, that's great to start out when you begin investing, but as is the portfolio size gets larger, you know, there's better, more efficient ways to really um, tax manage your portfolio. So we'll never let the tax tail wag the dog by any means, but this, all of this here on, on this page has to be something that you think about. Um, some basic tax management steps, you know, own municipal bonds in your brokerage account. Municipal bonds um, pay interest income that is exempt from federal tax. It could potentially be exempt from state and local tax if you live in the state of Ohio and you buy Ohio Muni bonds, okay? They're not going to give you, they're not a home run, they're not a grand slam by any means as far as returns go, but it's a great balance to the portfolio and you're taking the tax issue out as well. Um, another step to, to consider, really what Terry just mentioned on the last slide here, you know, Keep the turnover low in your portfolio. Don't be, um, you know, continually trading throughout the course of the year. Number one, it costs money, commissions typically, whether you're with a wirehouse or even an RIA like us, a registered investment advisory firm. Um, but, but it's also, uh, you know, the whole back to the whole slide, one of the biggest um, mistakes that investors make is trying to time markets. You know, avoiding short-term gains is obviously uh, another tax um, item to think about. So if you're getting close to owning a particular security for a year, uh, it may make sense to wait that extra month or that extra week to make that trade um, before you get out of that security. You know, short-term gains on investments that you sell are taxed at your ordinary income rate. Long-term gains currently, anyway, are taxed at 15%. It, obviously a big difference there between the two. Um, at the end of the year, this is a big thing that we like to do as well with, with our group and all of our clients and all their taxable accounts. We, we run through them and we see what has happened over the course of the year. What transactions have we done that have generated gains and or losses? Um, where are the positions currently trading in the market? Do we have unrealized gains or losses in the portfolio? Um, if we have a, a, a particular client that sells a business and um, or sells a building and is, has taken a lot of gains in that aspect of their life, you know, there's some things you can always do in your investment portfolios to help offset some of those gains, to help offset some of that tax liability. And it's called harvesting losses. And it's, it's very simple. It's, you know, you have a position in the portfolio that is trading at a loss currently that you may not like as a position anymore, or you may like, um, sell that position, take your loss, realize your loss, and then, you know, within 30 days, if you want to get back in, 
you can always trade back in to avoid you know that wash sale rule that, that the IRS has out there. Hopefully, you know, these are some things that you've thought about, but we also always at OJM Group, we try to educate our clients as well. And, um, you know, we, I'll talk about it here in a few minutes, but um, feel free to, you know, contact us or, you know, contact one of our partners if, if something comes up that, you know, really sh strikes you as interesting today. You know, a couple other items that you can do for really maximizing after-tax returns is, uh, they're listed here below, and I won't get into a whole lot of detail, but you can, you know, track your holdings by tax lot, sell different lots with the least tax cost or the highest tax cost, depending on what you're trying to do. And as I mentioned, avoid wash sales. So if you sell a security at a loss, and then you buy it back within a 30-day period, or if you purchased it only 30 days beforehand, the IRS is not even going to allow that realized loss on your taxes. So you, you know, have to be very aware of um, the different rules out there when you are, um, you know, doing the tax review of your account. Okay, so we'll move on to the next slide then. And I think what this is going to show everybody really is um, how much in a return you can actually add to your portfolio just through tax management. Okay, so Terry talked a little bit before about how you can add returns to your portfolio by, you know, keeping expenses low or maybe not using mutual fund managers that charge, um, have a high operating expense. You know, tax management has been shown as well as a way to improve returns in your portfolio. And here's the two, you know, this is a study here. It goes back 30 years, over the past 30 years, the potential benefits of tax management in your brokerage accounts. You know, you can almost add three quarters of a percentage point, um, even over a little three quarters of a percentage point to your portfolio by avoiding short-term gains. You know, I just discussed that briefly, and delaying long-term gains. You know, I will, I will sit here and tell you, I'll give the full disclosure that um, Terry and I do not give tax advice. I am a non-practicing CPA at this point in my career, um, so definitely always check with your tax accountant or your CPA in, in detail um, when you do have a tax question, but we can tell you that, you know, you can add return to your portfolio by doing tax management throughout the course of any given year. And again, these are in taxable brokerage accounts, not your qualified money, not your retirement plans, a little less to do there. So in summary, let's, um, what have we learned today? What have we educated you on? Um, I think the biggest point is that um, you cannot time markets. You know, we've seen it. It's been studied. We've read about it. Um, it, it really just doesn't work. Um, uh, you know, we talk a lot internally as well about you know, the trends of the markets today and what we see a lot of is, um, you know, technical strategies or timing strategies. And these strategies, they're not, you know, they may call themselves timing or technical strategies. They're not trying to find the high or the low in the market. What, they, what they're really doing is looking for trends. And the market seems to be, you know, if it crosses this line or you have a double cross in the S&P or, you know, those other terms that you hear about today, um, there's a lot of movement because more firms have definitely moved towards that route of, you know, when you have a certain level in either a stock or a general index, you know, there's a lot of automatic trades that occur that could either push, you know, the market higher or lower based on where you are. Um, those are based on trends. So again, this is not timing the market. You're not trying to say, I'm at the high, and therefore I'm going to make a trade to sell now. It's, it's, it's based on trends. Timing just does not work. Um, you saw another slide, I think, which was very important. And um, we expect similar volatility throughout the course of this year. Uh, you know, the first two months, the first six weeks of 2012 have been phenomenal, right, in the market. Uh, five, six, seven, eight, ten percent, whatever the number is in, in the different asset classes. Um, there is going to be a time where we might see a reverse of that. Down five percent, down ten percent. Don't overreact. You know, understand that this is how the markets work today. And um, 
you know, ignore the short-term market volatility. Remember to keep your long-term focus in, in, in the front of your mind because that's really what matters. And, and plan for that and, and don't plan for the, the, up, the daily ups and downs of the market today. You know, focus on your asset allocation. That's always very important in our minds. You know, that's how we really manage money. We start at the top and we look down at your allocation and, and we know that allocation typically drives 85 to 90 percent of your portfolio's returns. And again, you know, Terry touched briefly on what we think stocks are going to do and bonds are going to do over the next couple of years. And that's not really a whole lot. You know, a couple percentage points to the positive on average. You know, and that's why we have um, taken an institutional approach in our client accounts and we've added the alternative asset class space. We believe it is, it's, it's necessary and you have to have a minimum of 20% in your portfolio across an asset that does not correlate to the S&P 500. Okay, so you need to have, you know, the, the non-traded real estate holding. You need to have the gold or the oil holding. You need to have some hedge funds or private equity. You know, there's a whole list of securities that we could go through that don't correlate that we really believe that are necessary in portfolios today. Um, we learned about rebalancing. You know, it really does a lot of things. Two of the main things it does is it prevents us from holding on to um, that favorite stock of ours too long. And, um, of course, it's going to, over a long period of time, achieve the goal of buying when the market is down and selling when it's high. We don't want to be the average investor. We want to beat the average investor. So, you know, in the end, it's not what you earn, but it's what you, what you keep. And uh, I talked about a few tax management um, techniques as well. And so make sure, you know, you're definitely doing that in your accounts throughout the course of the year. It's, I mean, it's just so important. I mean, it's just a standard conversation come November that we have, you know, with clients. And um, I think it's very much appreciated as well. Okay, well, um, just finishing up, uh, I want to tell you a little bit. Uh, Terry talked about our firm, our partners. Um, this, you know, there's various ways that we can work with you as a client. Um, if you have not, you know, been with us in the past, uh, a free consult, of course, is the is a risk-free first step. So we offer um, an hour phone call with either one of our partners or one of our um, managers on the cash flow side. And, and they'll sit and they'll talk to you for an hour after you fill out a, a three-page data form. And um, they'll just touch on what they see on this form. You can ask questions. Um, it's a very you know, interactive conversation. And um, at that point, you can determine if, it, if you like what you hear, if you want to work with us further. Or if not, you got you know, a quick second review of um, maybe some outstanding items that have been on your mind recently. Uh, we, can, we, in, we are engaged often for not only personal planning, but also planning for corporations. So whether it's your um, practice, your small business, um, we can advise on you know, many ideas when it comes to financial planning. You know, a lot of times what I see, Terry and I run the investment division at our firm. We also have um, an attorney, David Mandel, one of our partners on staff, who takes a look at you know, how a practice may be structured. Are you an S Corp, a C Corp, an LLC, a sole proprietorship? Is that working for you? Is, does that make sense in today's world? You know, we have Carol Foose, who's a CPA at our firm, who gives you a second look at um, you know, your tax return. She's not going to do your tax return. She's not there to replace your CPA, but she's there to provide value and ideas as to how you can potentially lower your taxes you know, in the future. So um, again, personal level or corporation level, we have done both. Um, and lastly, you know, we have a few folks at the firm that actually can come out to your location and deliver um, various talks to a group. Um, you take care of our travel expenses we come out, we talk to your group for an hour, two hours, and you actually get CME credits as well if, if, if you may be a physician on the line. Different ways that we can work with your practice, your business, or you individually. Okay, well I think if we move on to the next slide, I have a
few additional steps. Um, everyone gets a free book. We have several books that you saw at the beginning of the slide presentation here. Um, definitely let us know which book you, you may like to read. Um, we'll get that out to you shortly. And um, we're going to have a poll here real quick, and we'd just like to you know, see how we can get in touch with you. How can we help? Um, what's the you know, best way for us to contact you? Email, phone. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just taking this quick poll here, um, let us know. You know, would, would you like a, a copy of the book? Uh, would you like that free consult for an hour? Um, should we contact you to discuss your investments? And feel free, please, email us or contact us as well, um, if that makes sense. And then we also have a monthly e-newsletter that goes out if you'd like to be added to that list. Um, that'd be fantastic if you can just fill this out. Thank you very much for taking the time today. We've uh, spent about the last 45 minutes with you going over some, you know, some really good ideas on um, how you can prevent yourself from making too many investment mistakes out there. Um, hopefully it's been helpful. Again, you know, part of our role at OJM Group is not only to advise and to, to manage money, but we want to educate you um, as a client as well. Because I think that those are some of our best clients, the ones that are educated. I think on the last slide we might have some contact information. We will leave it up here. Um, if you have any questions or comments, Terry or I can be reached as well directly. Um, our emails are kim at OJM Group or Terry, T-E-R-R-Y, at OJM Group. Thank you very much again. Have a fantastic weekend. Bye-bye now.